Hi, I'm Andrew Ritchie, a producer as well as a member of the RTF department here at ACC. Welcome to our second episode of Campus Spotlight, where we invite accomplished individuals to talk about their life, career, and the different milestones that got them to where they are. Mm. I'm very excited to be talking to a couple of guests from the documentary Running with Beto that aired on HBO this spring. It's an in-depth look at the campaign of Beto O'Rourke, which was designed to unseat the junior senator Ted Cruz here in Texas. I'm so excited to be welcoming Rebecca Pfefferman. She is a working producer as well as a strategist and the founder of FEFCO. Yep. And uh, Kelly West, who is a photojournalist, a filmmaker, as well as a professor here uh, on campus at ACC. Thank you so Welcome much. Both. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, thank y'all both for creating this wonderful piece of cinema and sharing it with uh, us and um, being here to discuss it today. Thank I'm you. excited about that. So yeah. my first question is, um, you know, this, uh, these documentaries I know take two, three, four years sometimes. How long were y'all working on this? All told, this was actually a really accelerated timeline for mm -hmm. a documentary. So it was two years from sort of inception to premiere. Awesome. Um, we were really fortunate. We had the sort of built-in timeline of the election mm -hmm. to keep us tight. Um, we began talking about what we were going to do in the spring of 2017 when David Bodigliani, our director, met Beto. Um, and then by the time we were up and running and shooting, it was November? Yeah. yeah. Oh, November 2017, we shot through election night. That was the end of the story, as it were, at the time. And, uh, and then we went into crazy, crazy edit cut mode. Um, although we started editing while we were shooting. So we started editing in New York in May, hmm. building the plane as we were flying, as David likes to say. And then we premiered at South by Southwest in March and we're up on HBO in May. So wow. it was wild. So giving that much time to a project, um, I'm curious of the personal reasons why each of you got involved in that. Um, I got involved, um, I go way back with David, our director. We, we've been friends for a long time. And I, my work has developed into sort of more freelance strategy and consulting around creative content. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I've done in my consulting work was work with a company called Crooked Media, who mm -hmm. ultimately became our co-producer on the film. They're a progressive media company out of LA that um, is staffed and, and, and built by people who used to work for President Obama. They're young, they're, they're entertaining. They sort of approach politics in a different way. So, I got into politics in a way I never had before by following them and working with them. Mm -hmm. Turns out David also went to high school with one of those guys. Okay. So we were sharing office space at the time. I met Beto independently of when David met Beto around the same time, spring 2017. Was very excited by what he was bringing to the table as a candidate, as a leader. He was just clearly so different than the status quo of politics. Um, and had been doing some consulting work with Crooked and all these roads converged and it was like this perfect opportunity to get to work with a friend of mine on something I'm passionate about and continue working with Crooked Media who I found really interesting. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, um, I mean, I think in some ways didn't know exactly what I was getting involved in. I got a call from David um, to about the very first shoot and, um, and I just love the story. I mean, I, I've been in um, photojournalism a long time. I just I like a good story, and it seemed like it was going to be a good one. And I was also looking for opportunities to do more documentary work. I hadn't done a ton yet, and so I was super excited to do that. Um, and then it just kept happening over and over again. And, <laughs> and it's before I knew it, there was like a whole movie. It was wild. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, a film like this uh, is a huge undertaking, and I'm curious just how it from the beginnings, how did it take shape? How did you approach the campaign and, and get it going? So um, it was a lot of moving pieces all at once and kind of trying to you know figure out whether we were trying to get financing first, who was our partners. Um, a lot of things happened concurrently. Ultimately what, what we had was the idea of that this campaign being something unique and special and different and that there was a bigger story to tell here with a bigger mission that was not about any one election or politician, but the idea of there are real people, there's real stakes to this election. You've got sort of this quintessential villain over on one <laughs> side. You've got this underdog no one's ever heard of on the other. You've got a, 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 the stakes are so high in the country, um, and we just felt like it was going to be an incredible story. So once we got Cricket Media interested um, to co-produce the film, it felt like they were like a, a legitimate anchor for us to go out and find some financing. And simultaneously, 
showed the O'Rourke campaign that we were going to be seen. This was going to be useful even if it didn't come out before the election because that was part of the initial resistance was, well, okay, you guys seem nice, but w w how is this going to help us win the election? And we said, well, it's not. That's not what we're here for. We're here to capture this moment in history because clearly you're doing things really differently. You know, he was running a completely transparent campaign in a way that was very unusual in the way he was using social media, the way he was fundraising, um, the way he was going places where no one had been before. Like Waterburger? Like Waterburger, <laughs> like towns, uh -huh. uh, like King County. Right. Um, it's, here in Texas is the, you know, the most conservative county uh, in the state. If not the country, um, with I think six people turning out to vote in the 2018 election. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of the ways David approached the campaign was sort of with that, uh, that larger picture, that story he wanted to tell and, and, and kind of in a biographical way and met with Beto. They had breakfast early one morning in October 2017 and he kind of pitched him on it and Beto said, yeah, you know, that sounds all right. And the team were like, wait, wait, wait hold on. Um, and so David actually went out on the trail with them for a few days without a camera um, to really kind of start building that trust and un have them get a sense of his energy and what it would it feel like to have him around and how he would be capturing. Um, and that was really the final sign off. And then we were up and running and Kelly was shooting uh, at the beginning of November. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. And I think in some ways too, I mean, he was always on camera anyway, yeah. like he, because he live streamed everything. Right. So mm -hmm. he, there, I think, you know, he was more comfortable with it maybe than some people would be because I think, you know, he was used to the idea of everything's being recorded. Yeah, mm. at the beginning for sure. At the beginning, yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, um, so often as documentarians, we sort of have to walk this balance between telling the truth and then keeping the trust of our subjects. Yeah. And um, so I'm curious, as you approached uh, Beto and, and the rest of the campaign, sort of what steps you took to win their trust, and then as uh, as uh, the project developed to, to keep that trust. I think Kelly can speak to that really well. She was there every day shooting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have those conversations one-on-one -on -one with the campaign necessarily, but I feel like that trust is built by how you are like reacting to people and being around them. I mean, just trying to, trying to be really aware of what's going on, trying to give them space when they need space. Mm -hmm. um, but but also like just being really clear that you are there to be kind of a fly on the wall and that you don't have some ulterior motive and you know just in the sort of side conversations you have with people trying to make them like you and you yeah. know um, but just to be like a real person even though half the time I just look like this you know with the big camera <laughs> in my face so yeah. we had a, we had um, we ran really lean um, mm -hmm. as a crew and mm -hmm. and so oftentimes it would just be Kelly or one of our other cinematographers and um, David and our sound guy and our producer Rachel or our associate producer Ari um, and so the O'Rourke team was also quite lean and so there just became a familiarity and one of the things that I heard a lot about Kelly's work was just how natural she was in a way that made everybody put everybody at ease I mean a lot of our um, footage is you know we're in this car in a car with them mm -hmm. and there's you know as as much as Beto was on camera all the time it still was often challenging to find moments where he was unguarded where there was moments of tension and frustration and Kelly captured those there's a scene in the film um, where you, you shot that right yeah, the, with yeah the, with Cynthia. He's like Cynthia yeah, yeah he's mm -hmm. in the front seat mm -hmm. he's frustrated because the you know, he's been back to back to back and he can't even breathe, he can't even eat, can't even think, and he's sort of dressing down his, his staff in the back seat and Kelly's mm -hmm. sitting in the front seat shooting it. And that's a testament to how um, natural her ability was to be in that space with them and make them feel safe. Um, mm -hmm. We never had any agreements whatsoever with them, the campaign that was always meant to be, we were an independent production, both creatively and financially, they had no say over what we cut or um, put so out there. No subjects off limits. No subjects off limits. Okay, um, cool. There was a healthy dialogue and respect mm -hmm. along from, from outset through completion about, you know, look, we, we, this is what we're trying to accomplish. This is the bigger picture. Part of that is we need to have this access. Um, we need to be able to show something different from the inside out as opposed to just being another camera on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was an ongoing, ongoing and constantly evolving process. But um, I think the, the people we had on our crew, like Kelly, like our other DP, Ellie, like our sound um, audio recordist, Brian Ramos, uh, Ari, Ari and Rachel, truly this core group made a huge difference to the trust. 
cool. Yeah. And so Kelly, being there every day, um, how long did you find it took for some of that wall to begin to fall down? Not just from Beto, but just the rest of the people in the campaign Everyone to else. where you got some honesty. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, it was like a very open group in, in general, you know, but um, I, it was like a few several months, I think, before they thought like, and, and before they just saw us as maybe a sort of normal part of it. And they still put up walls. I mean, let's yeah. be clear. And, and I mean, <laughs> and I think yeah. as like, as the campaign gained momentum and they started getting, it started looking like, whoa, this may not be such a like, you know, long unlikely, shot. yeah, long shot as we thought, you could feel them close in more, mm -hmm. you know, for sure. Mm -hmm. So that's, and it just, I don't know, that's normal though. I mean, people, I am shocked every day that people agree to like, let me do the things that I do, <laughs> honestly. Um, so it, I think it's a lot to ask of people and they, I mean, they were pretty generous, you know, with their time. Yeah. I'm personally curious, uh, the decision to include his family, was that a discussion with him beforehand? Or? Oh yeah, I mean David David was very, um, he spent time, he went to El Paso before we started shooting, he spent mm -hmm. a weekend you know, getting to know Amy, getting to know the kids, mm -hmm. getting to know Beto's family and close friends. It, it was all a, a, um, a give and a take in that way of like, See, you see me, this is who I am, this is how I, how I will be and how we will be and we respect you. Mm -hmm. um, it was really difficult for uh, Amy and Beto to make the decision that that was part of what they wanted, that was we could, we could capture, but it was so important and, and um, foundational to who Beto is mm -hmm. and what this campaign was and what the stakes were for him as an mm -hmm. individual versus, you know, and how hard it is to, we were just talking, you know, be away for two years mm -hmm. on the road when you've got these children who are growing um, and a partner who is in it with you and also, you know, has to, has to manage at home. So uh, it was uh, crucial to the story mm -hmm. and we were really fortunate that they, they let us in. Kelly shot in their home a number of times. Yeah, you just couldn't have told that story without Amy yeah. and the kids. They were so such yeah. a part of Beto's life. And to me, like those scenes in the film Everything, were the yeah. most, yeah. I, I mean, poignant. Like they, Mine I mean, too. they really mm -hmm. drove home. I think what, how hard he was working, how hard they were working, you know, yeah. to to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. and and they're so cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I, those kids are awesome. Well, they're great moments. I mean, as a father, they rung true very strong to me. So yeah. that was nice. Yeah. Um, so to to that uh, subject a little more. Um, Obviously, this is a film about a political subject. Mm -hmm. Would y'all necessarily say it's a political film? I have an answer. I'm curious what you think. <laughs> <laughs> um, huh. I don't know that I've thought about that before. I mean, it certainly has a perspective. You know, it's certainly promotional uh, of, of what Beto is doing, and I think it has a voice. So uh, I'm sure that people see it as a political film. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, to me, I mean, it, it, there's a universal story there, I think, that like, because you connect with him so much as just a human being, or, I mean, I, I, I do, I think, when I watch it, you know, and, and his family and the other characters who are in it, like, there's so many other great people, like, working for, for him in that, you know, tor like, towards the same goal in that film that, um, I feel like that's that. I don't think that was like intentionally the message, but I think certainly you could you could interpret it that way. Yeah. Well, I would say it actually was the message for us as we were setting out to make it. Mm -hmm. The idea was that it wasn't about this man and whether he won or lost. It was this bigger picture, and um, what motivates people to be, pro, be, be become active. Mm -hmm. You know, we have three other subjects in the film who are not running for office, but who are all personally motivated and emotionally invested in the stakes and the outcome of the election for different reasons, whether it's gun violence, whether it is women's rights or veterans veterans issues or voter registration um, uh, in low turnout areas. So for us, we the more people who saw this film or who still today will see this film, the better, even whatever their politics and whether or not they like Beto or not, because mm -hmm. it, it's a larger, we feel like it's a larger point of view on what it takes to run for office and why people run for office and why anybody would get active and engaged and be motivated to do more. Um, we actually did a, in our process of, of finalizing the edit, we actually did a, a feedback screening deliberately for um, I think about 25 self-identified conservatives in the Fort Worth area because we want the film to be, um, we want people who may not agree with Beto's politics or to, to Kelly's point, the kind of voice and perspective of the film which, which feels more progressive and rightfully so. 
but we wanted it to feel accessible to people who may not believe all those same things because it's, it is the larger picture that was the point of the film. Um, and in fact, one of the things we're working on this fall is using the film as a tool for impact, an organizational tool, um, nonpartisan ways to get people activated and engaged and inspired to participate in this um, democracy of ours. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think y'all do walk that balance because y'all capture those moments you're talking about, those very personal moments yeah. of how it affects him, how it affects his family, how it affects uh, the, the workers in McAllen and in different parts of mm -hmm. the states. And so I'm curious what discussions y'all had, both in production and post, as, as a production team, of walking that balance between those two. Sorry, could you repeat the question? So, uh, <laughs> of walking that balance between looking at these political subjects but also taking a little bit of time to look at these personal moments and, and making sure one didn't outweigh the other. It was tricky. Um, I, I'll, I'll be curious to know what you, how you felt when you were shooting, um, but in terms of the edit, it was a challenge. We, we got a lot of feedback saying, I don't know what this guy stands for, and it was like, well, we're not here to like tell you his positions. Right. You know, and we were sort of, there's a montage at the beginning of the film where, where you sort of see Beto go through all the 254 counties and that's condensed, accelerated. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially the, the, the picture of it starts out, no one's showing up and you get there and it's much bigger. But you know, he's given the same speech and, and you, we kind of cut through it, which is where he hits on some of his policy points. Um, so we needed some of that in there to show what he stood for and why he was different. But at the same time, the point was not to convey all of his policies mm -hmm. because it wasn't about that. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, for us, the, we kept that central question in mind always, which I was sort of just alluding to of this idea of like, what's the, What's the bigger takeaway from the story that isn't about whether he wins or loses, but but what does it really mean to be involved and to be um, trying to make change? And is that and, and we sort of asked this question along the way: Is this actually the story or not the story? Mm -hmm. um, it was very helpful to have the editing going at the same time, mm -hmm. which is pretty unusual. Yeah. Um, and we were very fortunate uh, that we were able to to swing that um, in our budget because. It was. It helped guide along the way to, to be able to make these kind of like tough calls on the day of, of like, yeah, that is interesting, and that person is compelling, and that story is so special. Did you say Diana at all? Yeah. So we there is a wonderful woman named Diana. Oh shoot, I know I'm blanking on Diana Earl. Name. Earl. Mm -hmm. Yep. She is based <laughs> in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and her son was killed, um, shot and killed many years ago, and she's been a really consummate activist. Is the Run, with Moms Demand Action, and she's she is very passionate, shows up everywhere, was a big part of Beto's campaign, and we shot with her a lot. Mm -hmm. She's an incredible person. Her story is unbelievable and emotional and powerful. And at the end of the day, it it, it was not part of the not part of the story we were telling, and it didn't mean that her story wasn't important to tell. But the bigger picture of what our film was, ultimately, we weren't able to include her, even though you know we spent so much time with her. Yeah. I rented her at the Carousel Lounge the other She's night. She's a wonderful She's lady. Great. Um, yeah, I think there were a lot of conversations like all the way through. I mean, it, I, what I well, one of the things I liked about working on this was um, David was all we were always talking about like what is the story? Because mm -hmm. in some ways, when you start that a year before the election, we didn't exactly know right. like well, we definitely didn't know what was going to happen. So. You're, you're trying to sort of assess it as you go along and like you said, figure out what are the important things. Like, wh okay, where should we focus our energy? We're a small crew, mm -hmm. you know, we only had so many days to shoot. So it's making those decisions in the moment can, can be tough. Um, I think, I mean, it, at some point it started to become a little more cohesive. I think as he got, like, as you could tell that he, you know, he was gaining traction. Um, but even still, I felt like those conversations went I, I mean, I think the very I first conversation I had with David, I was like, what's this movie about if he loses? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, because it, I think it's obvious if he wins, like mm -hmm. how, how that narrative goes, mm -hmm. but it's less obvious if he loses. And so like, what, how do you still make that a good story? And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just trying to be like ready for that along the way mm -hmm. and just shooting a ton. We shot yeah. a ton. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, what is it, 700, 700 hours? 700 hours, like, yeah. 700, wow. <laughs> I plus, was curious about the footage. footage yeah. That's, yeah. that's what that's, we captured plus archival. So, um, you know, news clips and, and all of that that we pulled. Right. So, and how long was the editing process? The, well, we began editing in May. We wrapped November 8th. Mm -hmm. um, we locked picture January 25th. Wow. 
So y'all just looking at footage around the clock? Or <laughs> well, I mean, how do you, how we, do you had, we had actually two editors in New York who were looking at footage on a, on a very tight schedule from you know the beginning of May through January 25th. That sounds yeah. intense. Um, yeah. Now, I know you've worked in sports some, is that right? Yeah. So I'm curious, it sounds like both from a post as well as a production, there's so much ground to cover and, and so many moving parts. Did any of your sports experience come into covering oh, that? I would love to say it did. <laughs> it, it, it really uh, it is all a credit to Rachel Eklund, our producer, uh -huh. who ran the production in like a boss. She is all of our boss. Um, <laughs> she was able to, I mean, she had this mobile office in the back of the production van where she was just constantly running running things at the same time as she's on the walkie sort of sorting out the next location as the mm -hmm. same time as she you know has helped david you know get his get his uh snacks for the day <laughs> david and, david and beto had, and beto, beto they, never yeah, had they had had neither of these guys ate and we needed to keep their blood sugar up um i mean she was in, she was truly incredible and and it is like managing an unbelievable team even when it was small it was so many moving parts because mm -hmm. it was um you know, Beto hit all 254 counties. I don't know if we did that, but I know we traversed, I think we counted like 47,000 miles wow. over the course of that year. Mm -hmm. So organizing and, and pre-prepping all those shoots, even if it wasn't every single day like he was doing, was an, a massive undertaking. And I think the only way you can really do that is to be organized and color-coded and um, responsive and on top of stuff <laughs> 24 hours a day, which is what Rachel did. Yeah, because things would change too. Yeah. I mean, all the time. Yeah. You know, we would we would have she would build these beautiful color coded <laughs> schedules, and two hours later, it's right. garbage. You know, right. so she, just She's having so to be yeah God. to be like so ready for change because that's how that's how the campaign is running it. They're yeah. they're very mobile. You know, right and. That were long days and also just knowing when to say like nope it's got to be like this and just stand firm on the things that we need and That's um right. and rachel had a really she really had a good sense of all that um keeping david in line keeping the crews moving knowing what we need and what we didn't and y'all found that much easier to do with a smaller crew than i would say so yeah i mean turn. i've never worked on a larger crew so i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i mean cool. i think i think i think um fewer resources make you be more creative and mm -hmm. make you be more responsible Mm -hmm. Consist consistently. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Kelly, I'm amazed you did all of this uh, while teaching. <laughs> 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 so uh, uh, that's pretty awesome. And I'm curious how this affects your ability to be able to teach in the classroom. Do you bring any of that in to the students and stuff? Yeah. You do I mean, there? I I love that I can bring like real life examples of work that I've done and stuff to the class and talk about those things. Um, it makes it more interesting for them. I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> but sure it is. is it? <laughs> Um, they, well, and I think they are mostly going into a world that is like a freelance kind of world. And so having that experience of having worked for myself and done that, I, I feel like is helpful at least to give them some um, advice about like what that's going to look like and in a real world sort of way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also teach them to push the buttons, but you know. <laughs> right. And it keeps me fresh too, like to have photography. I mean, it, it's you know it's an art but it there's so much technical skill to it too so just being like constantly having to learn new things that you know that it's helpful i think for them to have that feedback too uh, i'm sure you were also part of the education of david, david modigliani <laughs> so david um he shot some pretty good stuff he did but he david had never shot himself before this mm. film but by necessity because we were keeping it lean because we wanted to keep that trust there were certain moments where it felt like it was really only appropriate for David to be in the room just himself so he had a DSLR and I imagine Kelly gave him a lot of pointers on how to use it mm -hmm. um, as did our other uh, camera operators and and shooters as we went along yeah and, and Brian gave him Brian. lots of sound advice uh -huh. yeah 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 cool. yeah so she yeah. was teaching on, on the shoot as well <laughs> awesome yeah. uh, here's a chance for us to geek out what were y'all shooting on <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was on a C300 Mark mm -hmm. One a Canon. Um, mm -hmm. It's a cinema camera. It's actually, I mean, it's definitely not the fanciest in the mm -hmm. world, but um, it's, you know, for, for the kind of camera it is, it's fairly light and mobile, so uh, it, you know, made it easy to sit in the car for three hours doing this or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. Did you purposely try to keep your rig small so you could disappear, or was it just what that's, was? I mean, that's the rig I normally shoot on. I'm norm. Mm -hmm. I, most of what I have done in my life has been sort of like one-woman band kind of stuff. I mean, I come from like a news photography background, so mm -hmm. we don't have like the kind of budget to even have 
an audio person sometimes. <laughs> um, it yeah. was magical the first day that Brian showed up. I was like, this is the best thing ever. Um, so I'm used to shooting a smaller rig like that, and that it, it keeps me mobile. I'm able to like change really quickly as things are changing. So that's just what I'm used to. Running. Very cool. And how are y'all getting that footage? Were y'all sending that back to New York at the end of every day, or? I wish I knew the answer to that question. No, no, definitely not. It's I mean, it's huge amounts of mm -hmm. data. Um, we would download everything each night, or sometimes in the middle of the day. It just kind of depended on a, on the day. Um, but everything like same day downloaded to multiple drives as backups, and then um, they would ship it to New York. I, I think the next week. I'm not positive about that, oh, but okay, cool. some, somewhere around then. But I mean, yeah, because the editor was getting that stuff quickly. There was an assistant editor, I think, who was going assistant, through processing yeah. stuff and then and then yeah, getting it to yeah, getting it to New York. Oh. But it was it was a super quick process. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, it might be a little bit late, but congratulations on your audience award at South by Southwest. Thank you. Um, I know uh, so many students here hope to be there one day, right yeah. here in our backyard. Uh, and I'm curious if y'all have any advice on how to manage uh, a festival that has become so huge. Oof. Um, you know, I, it was <clears throat> particularly funny for me to be a part of this film at South by Southwest because I used to work there. Mm -hmm. So I spent five years running the PR for the film festival and serving as a programmer there. And so it was truly surreal to then be a filmmaker going through the submission process, mm -hmm. waiting to find out, finding out, then having to work with all their processes about how we were going to announce it and how that worked and what our screening slots were and what our ticket situation. I mean, it's, there's, so, there's actually so many logistics that you have to stay on top of. I feel like to the best advice I can give because it is such a large festival with so much going on and so many distracting elements all, to, all the time is to really stay focused on the things that are going to keep your experience smooth. So all of the logistical details, paying attention, reading everything that they communicate to you officially and noticing the answers that are not there and going and seeking them. Mm -hmm. um, because as, as hard as they try to communicate things, it's, it, I, I was like, I wrote this memo and I, where's the answer <laughs> to the thing I need? This is still my language, what's going on? Um, but it was pretty incredible. I don't know, what was, it, what was it like for you? Have you had other films at South Bay before? No, uh -uh. Um, no. It was that was a super big deal. It was really exciting. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it just felt kind of, uh, it, it, like I wasn't involved in all of that sort of yeah. process <laughs> of having, and I didn't have to do any red carpets. Thank God, like <laughs> anything like that. Not my deal. But it was, um, it was just really cool to see it all like come together. Um, I, I told like after the after the screening at Paramount. A bunch of people, you know, were like, how was it? Did you like the movie? That was the first time I'd seen it all the way through oh, wow. in its final oh. form. I'd just seen like versions and yeah. pieces up until then. And I was like, I don't think I saw the movie because I was like, that's my stuff and it's so big. I was yeah. just like overwhelmed <laughs> by how. But that's, yeah, surreal. that's the first time I'd had a screening like that. So it yeah, was cool. Our, our premiere was at the Paramount, you know, oh. with 1,200 people and Beto. And it was just, I think I blacked out. Like, I don't really even remember the day. Yeah. I think it went well. And he was a rock star <laughs> at that point. And too. he was uh -huh. a rock star yeah. um, uh, four days from becoming a presidential candidate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is also surreal. So we, so our, we had our, our premiere on Saturday. We had um, they, another screening that Monday, maybe. And then they had added what's called a buzz screening for right. us Thursday, that Thursday morning at 10.30 and at 8.30 a.m. that day, Beto announced his candidacy, and it was like, okay, well, it's slightly different now than it was two days ago, but yeah. like, here we are, and we have this, this film about this man who is now presidential candidate. It's really interesting. And I'm curious, to, to that subject, how do y'all feel now? You're watching another campaign. You got, you got uh, <laughs> sort of a shock from that, or you wish you were there a little bit for it, or? I do not. Really <laughs> <be there. laughs> yeah. um, I think, you know, conversations were had about whether we were going to try to pursue, you know, a quote-unquote sequel. Mm. Um, I think the reality of what that would take to both, um, on both sides, to both, you know, really capture what is happening and make it substantively different from what we had filmed already um, was just too much to juggle. And I think, I think everybody was tired. Um, even the campaign, I think they're all tired and they keep going. Um, so for us, it was we just feel really proud to have this captured this moment in time for this man who is clearly destined for bigger and better things, whether it is this election or another role in, in our country at some point. Um, 
and we feel really good about having that experience and having it ended as it did. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And then after all of that, y'all air on HBO, which yeah. is absolutely amazing. Truly I'm, bonkers. Yeah, I'm curious uh, how that relationship started and, and what that process was like. So, um, I mean, that's the dream, right? That's like, you know, you make a documentary, you want it to be on HBO because they are the, the top, top. Um, we were really fortunate. So part of this is the fact that we were shooting quick, editing quick, and we were able to pull together, like, um, we had a five minute sizzle reel um, in June of 2018. Mm -hmm. So we were able to use that for both additional financing and for these distribution conversations that was, it captured the tone, it captured a bit of the like the behind the scenes action. Um, it was a, a real um, boon to have as opposed to just s individual scenes, which we also had, mm -hmm. sort of loose scenes. Um, but I think really gave people the bigger picture um, early enough so that it, we were able to convey you know, to your question earlier, why does this, what is the story here if this guy loses? Like, mm -hmm. who cares? And that was a question we had from a lot of people who were like, yeah, maybe if he wins, let's, let's talk. Mm -hmm. um, HBO got it right away. We, have, we had a wonderful sales agent who came onto the project in the summer of 2018 and um, helped it make, uh, facilitate a lot of introductions and meetings around potential distribution. HBO got it immediately. They, get, they knew that this was a bigger picture story that was not about whether he won or lost. Um, and they actually uh, came on board fully and acquired the film in September 2018. Okay. So before we had the end of the film, awesome. um, they were on board and it was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were really, really fortunate with that, not just in the fact that we had distribution from HBO, but that we knew that early because it also helped us make, um, it helped allow us make some decisions about our editing process and our timelines and kind of let us off the hook because we weren't trying to angle for a festival sale, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to just really focus on making the best possible movie we could on the time that we had. Um, and uh, and they were really great partners for us. They were really, uh, it was surreal. Cool, Yeah, that's awesome. When did you find out about HBO? Oh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I was on a shoot. Um, I, I just remember that David was like, because kind of, he was still trying, you know, it's like, yeah. he's like, don't tell anybody. We didn't, he's it, was, like, it was September, and then we announced it in Jan January, so it was kind of, okay. you know. Quiet. Yeah, so, I mean, it was definitely before the election and yeah. everything, but, um, yeah, he was like, he was like, home box office. And I was like, in my head, I was like, what is that? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I was like, oh, HBO, cool. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, I mean, we were out in the middle of yeah. shooting, you know, it was just. Oh, um, man. Yeah, super cool. Though. The crazy thing was election day and election night when everything was going, you know, so fast. And we had six crews running, six or seven, I think, running yeah. concurrently on election day around the state with all of our subjects and getting, you know, secondary footage. And um, we were in El Paso um, and sitting in the production van and watching the results come in. And mm -hmm. I had this moment of like, you know, I'm a citizen and I'm a Texan and I, you know, it was an emotionally complicated moment to go through as a human being. And then on the other hand, I'm like, uh, we got to get the movie, we got to get the end of this movie <laughs> because HBO already bought and paid for it right. and they bought and paid for us to have all this access and to give them something good. So now what, all right, it's six o'clock, like what do we got? And it was like, we got to go to make sure that we get it now because we're on the hook. So that was also an interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't even think. Yeah, that I know. I mean, I yeah. I was in Austin at the um, at the Austin office headquarters yeah. following Zach. Uh, Zach. Yeah, who um, and so I mean, I yeah, I wasn't aware of all the things because you're you're just like in the moment. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to get the footage, and he actually. I mean, when it became sort of clear that uh, he was um, that I mean, they'd called it basically for crews. Um, he and his team just kind of locked themselves in their office and mm -hmm. like wouldn't let me back in which is I mean fair you know I think it was just really emotional for them so in the moment I was frantic because I was yeah the yeah. same it was like I felt like my job was to get the story and right. I wasn't getting the story and I was like right. freaking out but in the end it was totally irrelevant so yeah it was a fine. roller coaster six hours was, yeah for the shoot cool for everybody I'm sure for everybody <laughs> so, yes awesome um well, so many of the students watching and other people watching would love to be in the seats that you ladies are in now. And so I'm curious um, if you could trace briefly some of the milestones in your career from when you were sitting in college, hopefully looking ahead to getting here. So. Ooh. Hmm. 
a good question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just, I always wanted to be a newspaper photographer, and so I decided that's what I was going to do, and um, I, I worked at several newspapers. I ended up working at the Austin American Statesman for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and I think that experience was great for me because, like, newspaper photography teaches you um, to be really nimble, um, to be, you can cover anything, like I'm comfortable in any situation. I have to be my own sound guy and producer and you know, all of that. So like that, that whole experience was great. And, and I mean, the way I sort of transitioned out of just stills into video was that I went to UT and got my master's um, technically in photojournalism, but I took a ton of RTF classes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that was a that was really helpful for me. That really helped me sort of like switch over into this other realm. Um, and then other, I mean, this was huge for me, honestly. Like getting to work on this film was a really big deal, and it, it felt like a um, a big stepping stone in like moving out of just doing. Because weirdly, I feel like the news photography world and the film world have like zero overlap. I had yeah. one friend who made films. Like I didn't know anyone. She's the one who recommended me to David. So it's like I didn't know that world at all, and um, and now I'm working on like three or four different things. You, you know, it's just it's that's that cool. that's been huge. That's awesome. Super cool. My path is a lot less direct. I um, I wanted to be in entertainment PR when I was um, in college, and I worked in entertainment PR for many years, and that was my first path. And um, never really saw myself from the creative perspective. I was somebody helping facilitate things, but I was never a creator myself. Um, but I, you know, the biggest key for my career generally has been relationships, mm -hmm. um, developing relationships that are non-transactional. Um, and those tend to take me places many years later that I never saw coming. And that's happened a number of times in my career. And getting to this point as a filmmaker, which is really the first film that I've ever produced, um, I was I was tentative because I had not been a producer before, um, but I knew that the project was special. I knew I had expertise to offer both from a perspective of the creative, what is the story, the strategy, how are we making the most of these moments, how are we going to maneuver through industry relationships, navigate the campaign, you know, roadblocks that pop up, just sort of m helping sequence what we need to worry about and when. Um, I've worked with a lot of talent in my career, um, and David uh, is talent in a brilliant way, but also, you know, he, he needs some assistance sometimes and helping stay focused, and, um, and the goal is to make his job easier so he can get the film that we need to get. So as I was doing it, it was like, oh, wait, I'm, no, I, this is what, this is what I do. Um, and now I have a word for it, and I am a producer, and I am happy to own that word and, and feel comfortable with that role. Um, it came very naturally to me, and it was just sort of applied to this new setting. Um, and it was sort of unusual to have been in the entertainment industry in some form for about 15 years and have this be the first thing that I really was doing from the producing side, technically. Mm -hmm. um, but it, 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 I plan to do more. I really enjoyed it. And um, I think the key for me was that it was a story I was really passionate about. I was working with people that I really enjoyed, and I was still learning as I went. So. That tends to be my magic equation for whatever kind of work I'm doing, is if those three things kind of light for me, then I'm excited about it. And it could be sport related. It, can, it turns out it can be politics related. I did not know that until Beto O'Rourke came into my life. Um, but yeah, the passion and, and, and having those connections. I mean, David and I have been friends a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was exciting about this idea to work with him um, coming together. And a lot of my pre-existing relationships in the entertainment industry came in quite handy as we um, were financing and wrapping and you know, looking to get advice from people who had been in this world before in this realm um, and rolling it out, all of that, yeah. Cool, Yeah. well it sounds like this, uh, this film's been a game changer in both of y'all's careers, yeah. would you say? Sure, um, absolutely. So a lot of people aspiring and trying to get there can find those frustrating moments before that sort of breakthrough moment. How, how has it changed? Has it gotten easier, busier? What, what, what's been the change on the other end of it? It definitely, well, I don't know, that year was so busy, I'm not sure, it, it actually felt a little less busy right after that film stopped shooting, and I was okay with that, and yeah. I, need, I needed a moment. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, I think what changed for me is I started getting more of the work that I want to do, which is this kind of work, like really like 
storytelling, um, documentary, uh, you know, d just this kind of work that feels, I guess, meaningful. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I started, more of that started to sort of come to me without me having to look for it. Yeah. It's been a big game changer. I, um, part of it is my own sense of purpose and understanding and, and ownership of the role of producer and feeling comfortable about that. Um, and feeling like I have the tools necessary to go apply those same skills to something else I'm excited about. It is still very difficult to know how and where and when to do that. Um, figuring out whether the role of producer that makes sense for me is as, you know, like a freelance producer for hire or developing my own projects and, you know, sweating it out from the ground up and finding the financing and a director and, um, or, you know, partnering with somebody. It, it's all an opportunity that's out there and I have to do the hard work now of like mm -hmm. really deciding what makes sense for me and for right now and finding a, a topic that I'm passionate about whether it is a documentary or narrative opportunity um, and that's still hard and I think rightfully so. I think for me I have found in my career that even when I'm operating from a place of strength and success if I am not um, challenged and pursuing things in the way that uh, I've really done the hard work of understanding why I want to do them, why they matter to me, and what I want to achieve with them. Then the work is going to be subpar. The result, the process is going to be uncomfortable and muddy, um, and I, I won't necessarily end up where I want to be at the end of it. So that's something I've learned painfully. So as I've evolved my career a, a number of times, but I think that's the through line: is really still doing that hard work, uh, even when you have some success, to understand why and what you want to be doing next. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So what's on the plate for each of you next? Uh, I actually, well, I, I'm still, I'm working on, like, occasionally working on three different docs, like not, nothing as intense as running with Beto. Um, and then I actually just got a job with a company called Aunt Bertha that is kind of a tech company that works to connect people to social services hmm. and they hired me uh, to be a visual journalist and report on poverty and social services in America which is like wow. my dream job so it's incredible That's they're awesome. based here yeah cool Very so cool. it literally just started last week so I don't know like exactly what that will look like yet but we're in the process awesome congratulations That's to that awesome. thanks yeah, yeah. Uh, for me um, I have not found my next producing project yet but my consulting business is um, I have a couple different clients in the sports media space, mm -hmm. so um, one of them is a regional sports network in New York called MSG Networks, and they air the Knicks games, and the Islanders games, and the Devils, and the Rangers, um, and I advise them, I'm on retainer with them, I advise them on their overall content strategy, which is everything from producing original content to licensing content for their, line for their linear channels um, or their social channels, or um, they have an over-the-top streaming set, uh, app to what do they do in game, how are they evolving things like the pregame show, just whatever they can do to grow and maintain and evolve their audiences knowing um, that many people are cutting the cord and they are essentially a cable network and that they have this really iconic brand to work with and sometimes their teams are not that great and so they still have that exceptional challenge of getting audience to show up even when the games are not really that good. So it's been really fun, it's fun to give them, you know, we just sort of talk through ideas and execution and think through talent and um, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense and it's sort of a fun ongoing dialogue. And I also work with a woman who's on, on ESPN, her name's Katie Nolan and I help her manage her career. Cool, yeah. very cool. Yeah. Um, what piece of advice would y'all give the young filmmaker and young student looking, watching today, looking on at their future career right now? I mean, this sounds super easy maybe, because I, like I've done it already but but I think you really do have to decide it's kind of what you were talking about is like deciding what you want like what project you want to work on or what kind of work you do and like look you're gonna take lots of other work that isn't that right. but I think you like I think if price. you yeah if you don't know that that's what you want to do um, it's really hard to sort of focus your energy and and move anything in that direction I mean I uh, I remember the weekend, the first weekend we shot the Beto film, I was supposed to be shooting a bar mitzvah. <laughs> I punted that to a friend of mine. <laughs> I was like, you're going to make five times as much money as I do, but right. like, worth it, you know, right. because like that's the work I want to do. And so it's just like, 
I don't know if that's helpful because like mm -hmm. that's you know easier said than done but um, I, th I think that's part of it I would I would totally agree and I would add to that which is that knowing what you want to do isn't necessarily about knowing what your career plan is um, mm -hmm. because and I wish I'd learned that learned this <coughs> when I was younger w you know things like who you work with, um, how the day is going to go, whether you're going to be empowered to do the things that you want to do, whether it's creatively, operationally, those matter and those really impact your ability to succeed um, both externally and for your own self-worth and value. And um, it, those are hard to navigate and figure out, especially as you're young and you're, you need to put in the time and work hard and take on things that aren't necessarily full of passion for you. but. Um, I, I, this may be counterintuitive, but the thing that I would advise everybody to do is get into therapy because therapy is just as valuable for your professional life as it is for your personal life. And being able to go through professional challenges while you are understanding who you are as a person um, and marry the two is only going to make each work better because you've got to work for a long time. And, uh, and it's important to understand why you're doing it and what, what matters to you. And that may not just be what you do for work. I like that PSA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to therapy tomorrow. Therapy I'm is looking forward to it. Yeah. Great. And Kelly, uh, I'm sure there are plenty of students who want to take your class and get to all the knowledge so. out of you. Yeah. So what classes do you teach here? Uh, I actually just teach one. It's an introductory news uh, photojournalism class. Uh, I think it's called Intro to News Photography, actually. Com 1316. Um, we basically learn the, you know, just the very basics of how to use uh, a DSLR camera. But then, you know, how to shoot everything very manually. But then, as the semester progresses, we get into visual storytelling, uh, really like how to photograph people and strangers. It's very overwhelming for people at first. Um, I worked with David on that a lot, yes. photographing, you know, <laughs> getting in people's faces yeah. and stuff. Yeah, so um, it's a fun class. We have a good time. A cool. graduate of the class, David Modigliani, That's right. the director of Oh, did David take your class? No, well, no, oh, no, okay. no, no. He, he, just, he took, yeah, it just took, it, took it on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Cool. And is that offered uh, every semester? <laughs> it is. Uh, not in summers, just fall and spring. Not in summers, fall and spring. It's part of the journalism department. Cool. Well, I want to thank both of you ladies for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for this film. Thank you all for joining us here today. And I want you to look out for Running with Beto on HBO. Say hello to Kelly when you see her on campus. And watch for our next episode of Campus Spotlight on ACC-TV.